Welcome to the World's End DVD Extras. <laughs> Hello, I'm Simon Pegg, alias Gary King, and you're watching The World's End Special Features. The World's End! The World's End is about a boys' night out gone very badly wrong, or right, depending on which characters you side with. At a very sort of basic story level, it's about five school uh, friends who get together to uh, on the the sort of initiative of one member Gary King myself uh, to recreate a pub crawl that they attempted when they were 19 <laughs> we're just five friends on a night out having a good time Lovely. we've got to have one in every pub otherwise the whole thing's fucked I'd say it was fairly fucked already mate right the world's end is about guys just getting shit-faced. We are here to get annihilated. And drink. Five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, <laughs> That's the basic gist of it, but obviously so much more happens and it's about so much more than that in terms of the themes and the the kind of story and the subtext, and it, it's a complex brew, but essentially it's about a pub crawl that happens to coincide with an alien invasion. <laughs> Everybody run! It's really a film about midlife crisis, but um, these guys who are going through a midlife crisis are put in, in extraordinary circumstances, and that's where the comedy comes from. You know, I just spoke to your mum, and not from the afterlife, from fucking Bournemouth. Andy. No, no, she says she hasn't spoken to you for eight months. Andy, put in his head. You are not going to wriggle out of it this time. I think it's about people having to let go of their past and their kind of thoughts and their, their kind of beliefs that have gotten so far, you know. I think it's about people on the cusp of middle age, really. A lot has changed since you've left. I know. How much do you know? You know, obviously, to somebody else, it doesn't mean that. It's just a load of people twatting about. <laughs> what's this all about, Gary? Andy, what's happening? What's going on? What the hell's going on? It's about five friends trying to regain their youth, or rather one man trying to regain his youth and somehow corralling his four other mates along with him for the night. Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome. The central theme of the film is your hometown is not what it used to be. Is that because you've got older or has something else happened? And in this case, in the film, it's like, well, both. <laughs> it's like, sort of, the hometown has changed because you got older and it's not as nice as you remember it was. But also, yes, there is something else happening as well. Well, it's weird, isn't it? You come back and everything's the same, but it's sort of different. The idea, for me at least, goes back a long way because um, when I was 21, I had gone on a pub crawl in my hometown and had a kind of crazy night afterwards where I'd lost all track of time and uh, tried to kind of like meet up with this girl that I vaguely thought I'd made arrangements to meet. In, in r running away from the house in embarrassment, I ran into a clothesline and, uh, and knocked myself out <laughs> like on a clothesline and then woke up later. I'm not that proud of it, but it did stick in my head as being a particularly eventful night. <laughs> <laughs> Probably about eight or ten years ago, Edgar and I went and hired a car and a cottage down near Bath with the intention of doing a bit of writing. And in the end, because of one thing or another, we didn't do any writing at all. We just kind of drove around Cheddar. We didn't really do any work. I think we came up with the idea for this movie on a plane to Sydney on the Hot Fuzz press tour. Partly it came from a script that Edgar had... Um, had toyed with at a very young age called Crawl, about a pub crawl, um, but also about notions of going home to where you were from and it being very different. And we liked the idea that 
you know, it wasn't because you'd changed, it was because the town had changed completely and how had it changed completely? Well, it had been overtaken by, you know, alien robots. I think at that time it was simply that. Holy shit. This is all connected. I like the John Wyndham books, like, you know, Day of the Triffids and the Chrysalids and the, especially the Midwich Cuckoos. And uh, one of his critics, actually, I think Brian Aldiss said of John Wyndham, said that his books are like cosy catastrophes. Now, the thing is, I see that phrase and I think, yeah, but that's, that sounds kind of like there's something in that. And in a weird way, Shaun of the Dead and The World's End kind of have that element of cosy catastrophe in terms of, like, you know, it's a very, it's a very middle-class apocalypse. How's it looking? Normal. Very normal. Edgar, Simon and Nick, and Naira, who produces it, they make very good films. And it's a kind of film that I've never done before. So I wanted to be involved in it. And also, we all know each other. So it was like, do you want to come and spend four months hanging out, making a film? So it was a combination of the people. And I thought it was a very clever script, very funny. <laughs> it's very, very well written stuff. It's, uh, it's stuff you don't really have to work too hard at because it just is immediately funny. It does what it wants to do. You don't have to wring any kind of comedy out of it. It's immediately funny. It has a great rhythm to it. It skips along. Yeah, yeah, I got it. It goes, yeah, it is a pronoun. What is it? It is, yeah, what is? I don't get it. You just used one, did I? Yeah, it is a pronoun. What is? It. Is it? Christ, no! I, I think it works. <laughs> <laughs> the process of writing it was was swift and harmonious. Uh, Edgar and me always write together in the same room, but I think this this time was probably the the easiest in an odd way. And I think it's because we have a rhythm now and a understanding of each other's processes, and we were very much on the same page, perhaps more than ever. I think on this one, each of us had a lot to bring to it. You know, our own personal experiences, and and it's a, it's the most personal of the three films. I think. Sorry, sorry. Edgar said something to me very interesting when he, he said that every film that he's done with Simon and Nick, there's always been a biographical element to them. So there's always an element of you giving over your testimony, which I'm a great believer in what, as an artist, you do. You give over certain aspects, not through celebrity, but through an art form. It's really hard to, 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 to pick a sort of favourite scene because we had such fun with all of it. You know, we, I, I love writing the final scene, the, the argument with the... Um, with the light, you know, it was just, we laughed a lot during that. I think you've bitten off more than you can chew with Earth, mate. Yeah, because we are more belligerent, more stubborn and more idiotic than you can possibly imagine. We actually wrote a letter to the BBFC while we were writing to ask them how many times we could say the C word and retain a 15 certificate. And, uh, you know, we wrote, it was a very serious letter and we got a wonderful letter back very quickly explaining to us that, that um, it's all about context and about how one uses certain words and if it's used in violence or, or sexual violence or against a woman, it can be an immediate 18. But if it's said sort of lightheartedly, as we do often in the film, you can say it five times. So, uh, we, were, so we were like, oh, great, so we can say the C word like all these times. Your reliance on profanity is the measure of your immaturity as a man and as a species. Uh, why don't you just get in your rocket and fuck off back to Legoland, you c <laughs> I came to be involved when Working Title rang up and said, would I come and participate in a read-through um, of Simon Pegg and Edgar Wright's new film? So I said, absolutely. It's irresistible. We can all imagine reuniting with the people we haven't seen since we were at school and trying to relive the past or relive one of those epic nights out you had when you were 18. And it, 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 it's, it's fantastic. And there's always one guy who kind of hasn't moved on and is still just the same as they were. And you think, when are you going to grow up? I was only thinking, who's that in my group? And if they can't identify them, then it's probably you. Um, hey ho. It's a bit grown up, isn't it? Yep. The initial kind of concept was like a galactic Starbucks. It was like, what if there was this huge galactic corporation that was trying to Starbuck every planet in the universe into being this, you know, uniform brand sp specific thing, you know, and, and, and that it's, it's raison d'etre was actually very, you know, good natured in a way. It wanted the g galaxy to be a safe kind of homogenous place. And, but obviously at the expense of all individuality and everything that made Earth uh, 
what it is would have to be eradicated. And that became our, our, our big bad, you know, and that's what Gary and the boys go back and, and face when they go on their pub crawl. Are you guys robots? Well, the word robot actually comes from an old Czech word. Robotnik. Meaning slave. You don't want to do that. <laughs> oh, don't I? We need different terms. One for people that aren't robots, and one for robots that aren't robots. Does anyone know what robot means? Hello, I am a robot. Right, mouth six, seven, eight, one. Step two, step three, step four. Our intergalactic visitors want to make Earth more efficient, but to do that, they have to make people less human. And it's thereby about taking away all the flaws. But then the question is, is that, but aren't our flaws what make us human? So suddenly, Gary King's character, who has been the villain of the piece in terms of being an incredibly flawed person, is now human number one in terms of like making the case for like our mistakes are what make us human. Frankly, who the fuck are you to come down here and tell us what to do? I also feel like Edgar and me are slightly misunderstood as being parodists, if there's such a word. But you know, Shaun of the Dead was never supposed to be a a parody of zombie films. We wanted to make a zombie film. We just happened to make it a comedy as well. We adore action films and, and not being able to make an American action film because we're neither American nor particularly action oriented as people. We had to make it in the UK and it had to become a comedy so that we could do that, you know. And we didn't, in making The World's End, want to parody anything. We wanted to make a film. It is resolutely without any reference to any other film. What we thought we'd address if we were going to take on anything was the notion of British social science fiction and, and not parody it but but take on those tropes those ideas the thing that we thought was like it'd be great to do like a sort of uh, sci-fi paranoia film like more in the vein of like um, the Quatermass films or Invasion of the Body Snatchers or John Wyndham or John Christopher there's a really good strain of British sci-fi post-war social science fiction that's all of that kind of um, you know political paranoia and xenophobia manifesting itself in, in, uh, in science fiction films. The alien menace, the word menace is in inverted commas because I think in this film, the outsiders, the invaders, see themselves as benevolent. She's a blank, she's a blank. It's not like the War of the Worlds where they're coming and they're destroying everything. The network want to build, you know, they want to kind of, they don't really want to replace many people if they can help it with blanks. They just, they send in this certain number to try and gradually, slowly indoctrinate Earth and it could take two or three hundred years. You know, they replace a certain amount of people and from those people, from the personal political standpoint of the individual, it all spreads gradually, globally, until eventually the Earth is, you know. You could see it as positive, you could see it as cancerous. It's just an interesting idea and it comes from social science fiction. It's sort of a metaphor about that Ma and Pa kind of um, industry completely being wiped out by the super chains. But the, 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 the twist is, was the coffee any better in that old cafe or is Starbucks better? And the answer is probably the new coffee is better. And so it's this strange kind of lament for something that maybe wasn't that great. I don't remember this at all. Has it been refurbished? It's been bought by a chain, on it? Part of that nationwide initiative to rob small, charming pubs of any discernible character. Starbucking, man. It's happening everywhere. Can't take away the smell, though. Sure they tried. The Starbucking thing is more, I think, a, a comment on the kind of person who would say, yeah, it's Starbucking, man. You know, wh where you would say to that, well, what the fuck are you doing? You know, like... Nothing else in the rest of your life supports this, you know, rebellious streak about, yeah, it's Starbucks, like, as if just complaining about Starbucks is an answer, you know, it's not an answer. And I don't think Simon and Edgar feel that Starbucks is particularly bad, otherwise we wouldn't have been ploughing that much money of our <laughs> petty cash into it for the last two months. Maybe we're not the local legends you think we are. Gary King! Speak for yourself, mate. You're barred. The whole notion of, of being sort of superseded has always been a concern of ours. It was in space, back in space, we had the whole episode with the, the kids having the party upstairs and the youngsters, you know, that they get into trouble with in Camden. Uh, those things were all about, there's always somebody younger than you, there's always somebody, you know, that's, that's, that's going to supersede you and, and the whole idea of getting older has become particularly polarised in this one, you know, because we're all turning 40 and and our concerns have changed and our outlook has changed. Allow me to carry the legend forward that the man you have become 
be the boy you were. I think this film sells quite a profound message, which is never go back to the place you were born. I mean, I think it's really a, an existential piece about when midlife crisis hits, just keep going forward, really. <laughs> Don't look over your shoulder. The past is a scary, scary place. When we was on set the other day and we were fighting dozens of robots and heads flying all over the place and I was getting covered in blue ink, I turned around and said to Simon, why can't you just write a film about midlife crisis where we all just, you know, we, we all just have normal lives? Why, why have we got to fight aliens to... But that's what's clever about the film, really. Action. You need help, Gary. Yeah. You know, we've also learnt from Shaun of the Dead that it's possible to combine serious issues with comedy. You know, this is still an outright comedy. It's probably the silliest of the three, but it's also, yeah, it does have a very dark vein about addiction and, and suicide and all this stuff, which is kind of, you know, deeply serious. It can't all be a good time. It has to be bad sometimes, otherwise you'll never know how good really feels. They told me when to go to bed. Me! I like that about these guys, that they can take those themes and, it, and it's a totally different road to where I'd go with it if I was writing it. And I love that. You know, being silly is a serious business when it's done well, and I think it's a very necessary business. And there's an awful lot of silliness in their work uh, that is hard to do well, and, and they do really cleverly. How's, um... Vanessa. No, your wife. Vanessa. Yeah, how's she? She's good. You, uh, had sex yet? We have two children. Oh, twice. Get you, fuck machine. <laughs> we haven't changed, have we? What's he doing here? Gary King on the exterior appears to be an inane sort of like youther who simply can't let go of his childhood, but he's actually a, 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 a mentally ill suicide on the run. You know, you can't get much more kind of serious and dark than that. And, and we didn't want to shy away from that aspect of it, you know. It's important to us, I think, is we don't just want to turn the camera on to funny people and have them improvise and then knit it all together and release it as a comedy. We kind of care more about the process than that, I think. Let's do a serious, shall we? And so, yeah, it's, it, it is pretty dark, and, but I think it's gleefully dark, you know. How was the funeral, Gary? Your mum's funeral? It's difficult to put into words, but if I had to choose three, I would say really, really sad. Oh, no, that's two, isn't it? How about really, very sad? Because I've never done comedy before, it's very easy to be to have a laugh with people when the camera's not rolling, you know, when you sit down and have a laugh. And, and I found it very hard to bring that sense of humour and relaxation and timing to, to my work because I'm, it's not usually called upon. And it was very interesting being around Nick and Simon to the, and, and Edgar that they encourage you and, and, and nurture you in that way. I hate you. You fucking bastard. That's good. I'm going to go. Fucking bastard. I hate you. You fucking bastard. <laughs> in many ways, comedy is much more precise. It's, it's, it's almost more staccato and it's more. Um, there's more of a discipline to it. I love actors who are just like ordinary people who don't have that sort of like sense of self-importance that some actors might have sometimes who perhaps overestimate their position in the world. Uh, Eddie is incredibly down to earth and, uh, and just very skilled and that's what, that's the best you can hope for with an actor. <laughs> I think Eddie has had to dip into a different place to do this to find some different skills that he didn't know he had. You know, that he wanted to explore, you know, he, he's, he's great like that, Eddie, he's a kind of a technician as well, and so he, he would look at this as a challenge to play, you know, comedy. He brings a wonderful sort of sweetness to Peter, which, you know, as, the, as we started shooting and I did more scenes with him, I started to regret Peter's fate more and more in the film. I was thinking, oh, this is a shame. We always kind of had people in mind for the roles, and, and it helps to have our actors in mind when you write a, a role because it just makes them a little bit more 3D in your head, you know, to the point when, you know, we'd often write, <laughs> instead of Oliver, we'd write Martin Freeman or, or Eddie Marsden instead of Pete, you know. 
We wanted to get a little dream team together. You know, we wanted to assemble three other actors aside from me and Nick who just were at the top of their game. And that's exactly what we got in Martin, Eddie and Paddy, who, yeah, I'm a huge fan of all three of those guys. <laughs> They're all fantastic actors. And the times when we got to do big, long five, six minute takes of, of heavy scenes, I felt like I was at the friggin' Donmar warehouse. You know what I mean? It was. It was great. They're, and, you know, when you're acting next to Martin or Paddy or Simon or Eddie, you, you have to up your game. Each one of those guys in Eddie, Martin and Paddy, have a different quality, you know, and there are different kinds of actors. And, and, and it all seems to fit so well together. The five of us have an absolute blast on set. It's, it's, it's a very, it can be very silly and wild at times. We have to be slightly kept in order. For, for five 40-year-old men, we've got 11 children between us. We can be incredibly immature. <laughs> Eight, one! <laughs> I think they just wanted their mates in it, you know? I think they wanted their mates in it to, to sort of be whatever, <laughs> you know? I can't blame them, me, me not included in that, but I'd, I'd want those people in my film as well. You know, when you've got five people who all believe in a project and are all willing to stand around when it's at some points during the shoot, minus nine, and the crew are kind of caked in crystals of ice, and yet what you do is just laugh all the time. You know, it's, it's, it's a good living. It's a good way to work. Reset, very careful, please. Well, Martin doesn't like the fact that um, his, younger, his younger version um, needs a nose. Really, though? I mean, look. I don't personally see it. I don't see it. No. Look, I mean, is my nose that fucking big? It's like, you look like someone in a Bergerac. Martin's totally different engine, totally different actor, switched on all the time, um, very aware of everything that's going on around him, and it's just fascinating to see, you know. Was that modelled on mine or on somebody else? Was that modelled on Ken Stott or something? <laughs> His whole technique as an actor, I think, is... is um, is really admirable. He has incredible um, restraint and and subtlety, and but also, uh, you know, impeccable comic timing. <laughs> I can't believe it, man. We all muck about and we have jokes. And uh, Nick Frost um, is the joke of the pack, really. He always gets me laughing. Um, yeah, we all have a laugh, really. I think that's it. And I think it'll come across on the film as well. I tell you who's really impressed me. Nick is amazing at action sequences. He's just brilliant. It's just so funny and powerful. And it's probably all the training in Cuban Fury has made him <laughs> amazingly deft on his feet. He's fantastic. I love watching Nick do his action sequences. Nick's a force of nature. <laughs> yeah. Nick's an incredible, incredibly lovable guy, and just funny. Like I, I, he doesn't have to try, and he's a brilliant actor. Just great, great people to be around. Well, I for one think it's nice to see your faces again. Cheers, mate. I've really got a lot from him, and, and particularly Simon. I've just got back. I've just got back into acting on this film. You know, I was out of love with it. And I've only just started to find it again on this. It's been creeping back slowly, but it's it's really come back. And I've got a lot of Simon. He's very dynamic. He's very, you can see him thinking. And it's a real natural gift he's got, apart from being a brilliant comedy writer as well with Edgar. He's got a great natural gift. Um, when he's acting out a scene, you can really tell. And I, I don't think it's his technique. I think he just was luckily born with this thing where he visualizes everything that he's doing and acts it out, and it's been fantastic for me to see. It's, it's really given me a good, uh, a good kick up the arse, you know, and helped a lot. Simon's just brilliant, because so much goes through his face, which is just exciting. There's this wonderful shot that I was looking at this morning, and there's this expression on his face that's like, shall I rescue her or shall I finish this point? And it's a look of pure sort of dilemma and consternation, and uh, it's, 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 it's brilliant, completely brilliant. You okay, Sam? I need a cigarette. Rosamond came in for the read-through, and I, I thought she was off the table, to be honest, because she was 
with child and we were reading through I thought we can't possibly be ready to start the film by the time but of course it was you know eight months later that we actually started shooting so thankfully she was able to join us I had never worked with Rosamund Pike before and it's funny like we went out for dinner and she was asking me all about the character and stuff so who's the character based on so I told this story about a friend at school and I went out with his younger sister at one point and then we stopped dating and then my friend also went out with his sister so then there was, and then he stopped dating her as well. So then there was this extremely awkward period where we had both been out with our best friend's sister. And Roz being, Roz being super method goes, uh, you still in touch with her? Can I meet her? And I was like, yeah, I haven't seen her for 10 years, but like, um, you know, we're still in touch on Facebook and stuff. So I guess I could. So Roz went to meet her in her hometown, which was outside of London. I wasn't present. And in fact, I haven't seen her since either. But they apparently had a whale of a time and went out for a drink and a meal. And then sort of, uh, Ros came up with, yeah, I got it. So I look forward to my ex-girlfriend watching the movie. <laughs> I didn't know the character comes off very well, so she should be happy. Can we not talk about my sister in relation to A, massive wide-ons, B, Stephen's erect penis? All right. I mean, basically, the, the key character point of Sam is that she had it away with Gary in the disabled toilets when she was 16, and uh, one hopes that by the end of the film she might be having it away with Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Andy! What the fuck? As always, when you're doing action sequences, there's quite a lot of time between setups, and people aren't disappearing back to trailers and dressing rooms. I mean, Simon is pretty much on set the whole time. Um, and so, you know, you do get to know them pretty quickly. Welcome, bienvenue, welcome. Gary King is my favourite character to ever play because he is essentially a, a bad guy, really. I mean, it bless his heart, he doesn't mean to be, but he's just hobbled by his own desire to be young and to, to recapture the days of his youth. Come on, you got me! <laughs> he's somebody who just doesn't want to be older than 18. You know, he's faced with the reality that his friends are grown-ups now and that they don't want to do that, and that's not their idea of fun. Come on! Gary's one of those people who you'd say that their star shone brightly very early on and then faded. We all have those people who were the coolest guys in school. You know, all the girls wanted to go out with them, all the guys wanted to hang around with them, and then they end up being, I don't know, failures in life, really. Gary is the epitome of that. Gary's a wanker. He's done something bad to every single character, you know. He's the kind of kid that you'd know he was a wanker, but he'd come round your house and your mum would think he's a smashing lad, you know, that Gary King. <laughs> but he's, like, injured all of us and fucked us all over in one way or another <laughs> over the course of the year, so... Yeah, he's a great character, Gary. Edgar and I had this idea that the reason Gary dresses the same way is that it might not necessarily be that he's dressed like that for the whole 20 years, but he's dressed like this for that night. It's like when you see an American military officer commit suicide, you know, they put all their clothes on, they put all their bat medals on and their, you know, their white gloves and then they put a gun to their head. That's essentially what Gary is doing in this film. You know, you don't learn that until the end, that he's literally got nothing left. He's the most wounded out of everybody. He's the one that, that hasn't moved on at all, that's still trying to hold on to that part of himself that really can't move forward. And so he is a really damaged guy underneath it all. Fucking good. <laughs> in the outset, he appears to be this very frivolous, stupid, you know, slightly irritating guy. But in actual fact, what he is is a walking tragedy. You know, he's he's on a suicide mission. This is the world's end. This is all that matters to him. He doesn't care about the next day. That's why the appearance of the blanks does nothing but spur him on. You know, he has one goal in life, and that's to get to drink twelve pints of beer. And if he dies, he doesn't care. You know. <laughs> I think ultimately it's about Gary facing up to his his demons, really. So, the plan is, we're going to go back to Newton Haven, we are going to do the Golden Mile, and this time we are going to make it to the world's end. Everybody's in. What, even Andy? Nick Frost is playing Andy Knightley, who, when he was an 18-year-old, he was the rugby boy brawler and kind of like the sort of the ultimate beer monster, and now there's an unspoken incident which has sort of severed their friendship forever. Mr Knightley. Felicity. You have a friend here to see you. No, I don't. Andy's moved on, 
you know, he's a big shot lawyer with a family and I imagine him driving some kind of high powered five series BMW. Uh, and Simon's character hasn't, you know, he's exactly the same. He drives exactly the same car, he has the same mixtape, he's, he's wearing the same clothes, you know, he hasn't evolved at all. And that's, you know, that's where a lot of the tension lies. It's, they're constantly looking back and trying to reference the past when it's not always the healthiest thing to do, you know. You're enjoying this, aren't you? Yeah, just five guys on a night out, having a great time. Pretending to have a great time. Are you pretending? If we get out of here alive, I'm going to kill you. Yeah, Andy just wants nothing to do with the past anymore. He doesn't, he, you know, Newton Haven represents all that disappointment and all that kind of lack of scope, and now he's away from it. He's kind of ashamed of it a little Wait. bit, I think. What the hell is this? Why are we even here? We are here to get annihilated. You know, Nick's a really good actor, and we didn't want to just have him be the foil all the time, you know, and, and, and so Andy is much more of a complex character. You know, he starts out hurt and serious and, and devolves as the night goes on into something more like he was when he was younger and and so it, it, and it's a different dynamic as well between Nick and I you find out toward the end of the film Andy's marriage is in trouble and he has no one at home so that's that's the reason why he decides to to go on the pub crawl even though he's absolutely teetotal and has been for 16 years you know after this terrible thing happened I think ultimately Gary disappointed Andy, you know, Gary, he looked up to Gary for so long and, and then, you know, the, the sheep was drawn away and Gary was just this pathetic idiot. Shots! S-H-O-T-S, -S. shots! What are you doing, Gary? And what you find out at the end is, is that's what he's most angry about, is that Gary let him down, you know. He loved Simon's Gary, you know, he, he really looked up to him and, and so when he, you know, when he lets him down so terribly, it's, it's a real blow, and I think he struggles and, and fails to recover from that. You know, it informs upon him for the rest of his adult life up until the point when he decides to get off that train and get into the beast. Come on, your bell ends, we're going to be late. There is something in Gary's tenacity and there's something in his naivety that it nearly does work, actually, in, in holding the group together, because he's like a whirlwind of enthusiasm and denial, <laughs> you know what I mean? While we're all looking at him slightly askance for different reasons, um, that ball of energy, you just have to give in to it. Okay. <laughs> Martin Freeman plays Oliver, who is somewhat based on, when I was at school, there was this kid in my kind of year who was the first kid I ever saw with a mobile phone, a huge mobile phone, which I thought was absolutely ridiculous. You know, he's the kid at school who would have been a yuppie. Hello. Hello, mate. Are you here? Yeah, I've been here for ages, what are you talking about? Uh, you get lost on the ring road again? Oliver's constantly on the phone, constantly elsewhere doing deals or, you know, listening to business news. I think the idea is that he's slightly detached in the five because he always had uh, pretensions at school of being a sort of Gordon Gecko, and now he's getting to act out that fantasy life as a reasonably successful estate agent. Gary, WTF? It's good to see you too, old man. He's very sort of smart and sharp and uh, a bit of a know-it-all, but it's kind of like his Achilles heel is the fact that he has a pretty sister that all the boys fancy. Hi, Sam. Oh, crumbs. My character is Sam Chamberlain, who is the younger sister of Oliver Chamberlain, who's played by Martin Freeman. All right, big brother. Oh. Gary. The relationship she has with Paddy's character is, is very sweet. You know, they, they obviously liked each other when they were young, but it never happened. It was like Stephen's great love when he was a teenager. He just fell head over heels for Rosamund's character. He can't believe that he's back in the presence of the love of his life, but also there's that threat of Gary being on the fringes of the swamp. So do you want it? Stephen, <laughs> I think Stephen was somebody who wanted to be the leader, but he never quite made it because Gary was always one step ahead of him. That's Gary King. Stephen Prince is like the kid at school who was like the um, the second most handsome. <laughs> like we always call him the, the he's like he was like the George Harrison of like the group. Stephen fancied girls, but Gary got there first. And so there's this kind of rivalry where Gary at school at least had always triumphed. It is not the same anymore, Gary. 
And it's not that the town's changed, we have changed. In the years in between them splitting up as teenagers and coming back, I think Stephen's tried to put some distance between that version of himself and the new one. And I think he quickly realises when they meet again that he really hasn't moved on. As soon as they get back together, that dynamic kicks in and Gary's still the leader and Gary's still the person that he can't get one step ahead of, who he resents, really, and doesn't come to really love till the end of the movie. Something always got in the way. They've all outgrown Gary in certain ways, but in others, they're still deeply rooted to him, you know. He gets them all individually in the ways that he always used to manipulate them, you know. He kind of bullies Peter, he, he flatters Oliver, he challenges Stephen. And he, and he emotionally blackmails Andy. And, you know, even though they've all grown up, Gary's still, they're still in Gary's thrall. We are going to the Beehive. Gary's plan is still the best we have. I play Peter, who is kind of, uh, he's the wallflower of the group. He's the one who could never really pull the girls and, 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 and just was a member of the gang because his old man was minted and they could all go in his swimming pool. Hello, Peter. Jesus. Gary the once and future king. Peter kind of idolizes Gary. Unbelievable. Gary was the coolest guy in the school, and, and so Peter always wanted to hang around with Gary. So even when Gary comes up with the idea of the pub crawl, and they're all both in their 40s, it still appeals to Peter because he still feels as insecure as he did when he was 16. Let battle commence. He's the guy Gary goes to first, Peter, because he knows he'll get Peter straight away, because Peter's always been his fan, you know? And there's a tragedy in that, you know, and a sweetness. He's been bullied, so he's a victim of bullying, and he still lacks self-esteem and, and self-confidence. Peter is often just looking around like, you know, like a still a 16-year-old boy, like, like a fish out of water. It's funny that when all these characters get together, essentially they're still the same people they were when they were 16 and 17. So that's what Peter has to overcome. He has to find himself and find his self-esteem and find his courage throughout the story. Here we go. Let's I'm a guys. bad man. I was bullied at school, and I bullied. I was, I was kind of in the middle of the pecking order, you know. So I could identify with Peter, and I could identify with what it's like to, to, to come face to face with the guy who, who bullied you and made your life a misery for five or ten years. So it's very, very poignant. Leave it, mate. It's not worth it. Yes, it fucking is! <laughs> Edgar's always had a very innate kind of organic talent which which I've always marveled at you know right back to when we were working together when he was in his early 20s it's getting too loud at the start I think sort of like rise and then fall a little bit yeah I think Edgar came out of the womb as a um, incredibly talented genius filmmaker he's pretty damn great <laughs> I think he's brilliant and um, innovative and his his shot composition is just really cool I love Edgar Wright. I think he's a genius. I really do. I love it. I love how he walks that film through in his mind. His incredible mind, the way he shapes things and, 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 and plans things out, he's got it all in his head. It's an incredible discipline he has. I think doing Sean and definitely doing Scott Pilgrim, it's given him a, a richer palette to draw from because he knows exactly what can be done technically and he knows exactly when to use it, you know. He's still as beset by the pressures of it on set, you know, he still frowns a lot, he still rubs his beard and his moustache when he can't figure out a problem. He's still in a world of his own a lot of the time, you know, he's not always that easy to approach on set because he's so in the moment, but it's it's all part of his process. Here we go. Let's come to the one, guys. Here we go. He likes a lot of takes. He's very, very precise. He's very exact, works very hard. He knows exactly what he wants. And he'll do as many takes as he wants until he gets what he needs. Neither of us like to compromise unless we really have to. So, um, I don't know, it was quite nice meeting a director who just wanted what he wanted and we just, you know, fought for every single thing together. Yeah, give it. Yeah, cool. You just have to sort of, you know, watch and learn, really, with Edgar and Simon. I mean, they're an advanced species of human being, really. Um, you know, I, I, I just marvel. I, I sit and think, when will I become as evolved? <laughs> Sorry. I love working with Edgar, you know. You can just sit back and relax and just know that it's going to be a hard 13 weeks. But you just, you know, you're going to get a, 
a, a great film at the end of it. Meh. Edgar is a perfectionist, and you cannot argue with perfectionism. It's impossible, because you're arguing against perfection. And so if you say, oh, we should move on now, and he's like, no, you say, well, OK, we shouldn't then, because you haven't got what you want, and what you want is perfect. There is no room for imperfection. Hey, Earth isn't perfect, all right? And, and humans aren't perfect. And guess what? I ain't perfect. Working with Edgar is always a challenge, but it's one that's infinitely rewarding, you know. Please, be seated, kids. Now, let's have a little chat about your future, shall we? If you watch Hot Fuzz, there's a scene in Hot Fuzz when uh, the Village of the Year judges come across the devastation that is Samford, and there are three judges, and this thing falls behind them, the, the Village of the Year thing. One of them's my mum, one of them's Edgar's mum. And the middle guy is a guy called Mr. Wilde, who was Edgar's drama teacher. And uh, Mr. Shepherd is very much based on Mr. Wilde, who, who is this sort of cool guy, you know, the teacher that everybody likes, the teacher that isn't a threat. So we needed someone who had authority and was cool and someone that they all could aspire to. And, and Pierce's name came up. Silence, please. Sh sh shooting. Well, I don't know about cool, I don't know about authority, but anyway. You know, one just tries to pretend at the end of the day. Uh, Mr. Shepard, please, call me Guy. All right. Guy. <laughs> <laughs> Edgar phoned me one day and said, what do you, what do you think about Pierce Brosnan? And I was like, what, really? Are you for real? Because we, you know, in, in our discussions, we hadn't really aimed as high as Pierce. You know, we, we were talking to some great actors, but certainly not someone with Pierce's sort of, like, movie star credentials. Guess what, kids? They want us along for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty cool, eh? I think he had a good blast working with the cast, because, like, you know, his scene is with all the other actors, and, you know, at the point that he comes into it, they're all quite drunk, so he's sort of playing a very, like, straight, sobering influence on these kind of, like, sort of increasingly juvenile drunks. Are you a robot, sir? No, Peter, of course I'm not a robot. They revert to their childish behavior when they encounter Mr. Shepard, and Mr. Shepard, I suppose, in name alone, is this man who is uh, their counselor, their, their, their cool teacher, the man that they always went to with their problems, and so they take refuge in his, uh, his being there in the Beehive pub. But you're on their side, though. This is not about sides, Stephen. It's not about shirts versus skins. It's about working together as one team. He's just brilliant. I, and one of the things that, that, for me, just really identified Pierce's professionalism and, and worth, as, as not only as an actor, but as a human being, was that in all the scenes where we had to look off camera and imagine Mr. Shepard doing stuff, Pierce was there for that. He stayed the whole day and he did all his off lines and all his off eye lines. I mean, not all actors would do that, but Pierce actually stayed behind and did all that. And, and for me, that was like sainthood. Also, what's great about him is that even though he's most famous for his kind of action and parts and bonds, you know, he is a great comedy actor. You know, if you've seen The Matador or even in films like Mars Attacks or Mrs. Doubtfire, he's always really funny. <laughs> In the first couple of drafts of the script, it was the character's name is Mr. Wilde. There's a bit in the film where they talk about a Shakespeare quote on the wall, exit pursued by bear. Drink up, let's boo-boo. Boo-boo, what is that? You remember let's boo-boo? You know from Mr. Shepherd's classroom, it said on the wall, exit pursued by a bear, you know, from that Shakespeare play? A Winter's Tale. Yeah, what was it called? A Winter's Tale. That's it. That was on my theater studies kind of classroom. And me and my friends used to stupidly joke, because we were 17, we used to say, Exit Pursued by Yogi Bear. And, uh, and then it became like, you know, so the whole joke in there of like, let's Yogi and Boo Boo, let's Boo Boo, came from, came from that. It was like, came from that quote. Drink up, let's Boo Boo. Got 
enough. This is the world's end, man. I know. The thing is, is that when we started writing the world's end, we thought, well, actually, maybe we can make this a trilogy. And I think people will understand when they see the film that it is like a thematic wrap-up. It's a new story and with new characters, but it does continue and resolve themes from the other movies. It's about closure, right? The network are like a cross between the NWA and the zombies. You know, they're sort of a, a sort of coming together of those two forces to create this super enemy, which is what we face off against in The World's End. And so it's a fitting conclusion to those three films. Pretty good, pretty good, pretty good, pretty good. Sean is like sort of the, um, the nonchalant Londoner's take on the zombie apocalypse. What do you think we should do? Have a sit down. Hot Fuzz is the passive British policeman's take on a Michael Bay film. And The World's End is like a quest movie with an extremely irresponsible King Arthur at the helm of it. You've never taken a shortcut before? I'm coming! It didn't feel any different to Hot Fuzz and Shaun of the Dead in terms of we are making a film that will make each other laugh. And the millions of people around the world who are like us and share our comedy sensibilities and our love of genre film. And just get off me! We always take care when we're writing to make the experience of watching the film a, a, a gratifying one. You know, there's always connections to make, and I hope people pick up on that and see The World's End as a unifying chapter in the series of three films. I think it's very important for us that we have developed a fan base of very loyal people who like our stuff. And this is the third film in the trilogy, and we want it to be a great send-off. 